Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Monday, November 6, 2017. Even I have been shocked by the extreme denial and defensiveness exhibited by Hillary Clinton loyalists in the face of the revelations by Donna Brazile that the DNC was used to promote Hillary and to stop Bernie Sanders. Now, the word rigged was used by some headline writers, and Donna Brazile has walked that back. And let me be fair. Donna Brazile has had a flash of honesty, a moment of candor. And yes, she is hyping a book. In fact, this has been very effective book promotion. I think we can all agree. But let's keep in mind that the split between Sanders and Clinton supporters from 2016 This wound, the scab, was popped by Hillary Clinton's ongoing book tour. I mean, she is still doing interviews (laughs) to promote her book, which is a defensive effort to shift blame to Russia and to other factors for her stunning loss last year. And I've been surprised by how otherwise rational, politically savvy individuals can suspend their critical thinking and just reflexively say, oh, no, this can't be true. And it showed up in sharp relief on my own Facebook page. If you listen to Friday's News and Comment podcast, maybe you're one of the people who watched it on Facebook, either live or watching the recording. I delved into the issues that Donna Brazil has uh, raised. And when I posted the podcast... I wrote, Bernie, you was robbed. Donna Brazile confirms the DNC control and manipulation of funds that delivered the nomination to Clinton. And many people agreed with me, and I won't bore you with that. But my friend Lisa, who spent more than 20 years working in the trenches as a Capitol staffer in Sacramento, her first post was, I think, Peter, This is fake news stirred up by the current administration. My take. And I said, Lisa, please read the Politico article by Brazil and tell me how she is promoting fake news to help Trump. Lisa responded, I read it. I think this is a rehash from the past and some personal scabble between political players. I would much rather battle now over the president sitting in the White House who must be removed from power. And I wrote, as you wish, but it's not fake, not stirred up by Trump, that's the Uranium One story, and provides solid confirmation of how the DNC blocked Sanders. And others joined in, like Billy, Billy Cook. He said, Lisa, would you rather waste your time on fantasy? The Republicans control both houses of Congress. How do you expect to remove 45? Santa Claus can't help you. (laughs) Lisa was back. Bannon and Trump love this story of Brazil's book. It fits their agenda today to change the conversation about Mueller's investigation into Trump's clear relationship with Russia. Then Elizabeth Ferrari pipes up. Lisa, your focus on Trump is reactive. What are you doing to rehabilitate a mostly dead Democratic Party? Calling facts not in dispute fake news is an abuse of the language we used, we used to only expect from the other side. Then Carla Mahoney joins in. Lisa... The reason to focus on this is that it involves major uh, dysfunction, if not illegalities, within one of the two major U.S. political parties. It's not news to any of us familiar with the 2016 campaign, but it's been ignored, dismissed, and ridiculed. Lisa responds in an irrelevant manner. The biggest threat to our democracy is President Trump and his administration. Without removing him, you could soon have no democracy to protect. Then former independent presidential candidate A.C. Tyler comes in. Lisa, Trump wasn't in power when the DNC proved that democracy for this nation is dead. He's the sick and twisted result of that death, not the cause. And later on, Lisa posted in the same part of the thread, I assume we have Trump trolls still on Facebook. It's a sad fact. (laughs) Well, none of the people who posted on this were trolls because I know each of them as listeners of my podcast, or I, I know them better than that. And she shifts back to the clear and present danger is this president and his administration. 
Then Susan clocks in, and Susan is a former county supervisor who I worked on campaigns for. She even ran for Congress when our congressional seat was open back in 2010. And she opens with, Sanders isn't a Democrat, so why should anyone expect the DNC to support his nomination in the first place? He should have run as the independent that he is. Let's move on. My priority is getting Trump and his cronies out of office. Well, first of all, it's a canard to raise this issue about whether Sanders is a pure enough Democrat. He was a legally qualified candidate in the primaries on the Democratic ticket. He brought, uh, uh, I believe, 1,800 pledged delegates to the convention. And a lot of people I saw on other Facebook threads were saying, well, you know, Bernie didn't get as many votes as Hillary. But he was very close in delegates, less than 200 was the gap. And if the superdelegates had not been locked down, there would have been a contested convention. And who knows? Would Sanders have prevailed? I don't know. But that opportunity was foreclosed. So then Kyle Kalman checks in. We can't move on until we acknowledge what has gone wrong and still is. The recent DNC purge shows the Democratic Party is corrupt to the core. These are crimes we're talking about that need to be investigated and prosecuted. The people who donated to the Dems were lied to about a fair primary system. Then Susan responds, I'm not sure about the veracity in any media reports anymore. I didn't vote for Bernie. He lost me when he said Hillary was unqualified. And, all caps, he is not a Democrat. <laughs> And then Barbara Friedkin, who's a longtime pro-Hillary, uh, and, and she's not a paid troll, but uh, she trolls me. And she says, Peter, you haven't been keeping up. She took it all back. Donna Brazil, under editor, realized there were huge holes. The truth is that Bernie actually took money from the committee and didn't help anybody on down ticket prices, and they stole documents. Well, that's kind of incoherent. Peter, keep up. Go to my Facebook page and scroll down. This woman has lost every election. Now we're attacking Donna Brazil. And I've been open. I, I am not enamored of Donna Brazil, but that doesn't mean she didn't tell the truth about the contract that the Clinton campaign signed with the DNC, along with massive loans, starting in August of 2015. So, uh... Oh, and Susan closes by saying, hey, Peter, as always, thank you for initiating a provocative discussion. Now let's start a strand about solutions and strategies to move forward. Signing out of this conversation, sending out virtual hugs. <laughs> well, thanks for the hugs, Susan. I'll take them and return them. But it doesn't resolve the irrelevant arguments that you put forward in the face of these rather devastating allegations. This was followed up on Saturday night by a brief letter signed by 100 Clinton staffers. The letter reacted to the release of a second part of Brazil's new book, where she tells that after Hillary fainted at the September 11th memorial, and that was caught on video, and it was more than just fainting. She was really out of it. She couldn't walk. She was hustled by her, her staff and basically hurled into a minivan and taken away. And the issue that was raised was whether she was healthy enough and competent to continue the campaign. And I raised that question at the time and was batted down as a misogynist who uh, didn't understand pneumonia. Well, I've had pneumonia, <laughs> and what Hillary exhibited is not related to pneumonia. It appeared much more serious than that. But the 100 Clinton staffers in their letter swiped at Donna Brazil saying it's particularly troubling and puzzling that she would seemingly buy into false Russian-fueled propaganda spread by both the Russians and our opponent about our candidate's health. Well, the campaign was stonewalling. Hillary disappeared for a couple of hours, maybe saw a doctor, maybe got a shot of some sort, and then she's strolling on the sidewalk uh, outside her daughter's apartment saying, hey, what's wrong with you? Well, these were important questions. Now, the idea that Donna Brazil could lead the DNC through a Byzantine process to displace Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine and replace them with her choice of Joe Biden and Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey, that is bizarre on many fronts. Now, it does reveal who Donna Brazil is. 
She's a centrist party, corporate party loyalist who thought that Joe Biden would be the man to parachute in and defeat Donald Trump. And who are you kidding? And there is no mention in any of the news coverage I've seen about this part of Brazil's book that she even for a moment considered that the guy who came in second in the primaries, Bernie Sanders, would be the appropriate person to replace Clinton if that process ever went forward. Now, this is all hypothetical, a whole lot of ifs, but I find that very revealing about who Donna Brazil is. And nevertheless, she has been pilloried by the Hillary fans, along with Elizabeth Warren, who gave a couple of TV interviews saying, yeah, I think it was rigged. Now, Warren has her own problems, that she failed to endorse Bernie in the primaries last year. As I recall, the only Democratic senator who did was Jeff Merkley of Oregon. But Glenn Greenwald has done a great job in his skills as an attorney and an arguer come full full frontal in a lengthy piece he published at The Intercept today, debunking four viral falsehoods related to this whole uh, mashup last week. He says, the day after Politico published the first installment from Brazil's book about whether the primary was rigged, the following day NBC published an article by Alex Seitzwald. He's a guy I know a little bit. Very reliable insider Democrat. And his piece recited and endorsed the Clinton camp's primary defense that Donna Brazil was wrong because the agreement in question applied only to preparations for the general election. This had to do with the distribution of the big-ticket fundraiser dollars. And I use the George Clooney dinner as the most visible example, but there were many of them. And Hillary was collecting up to $350,000 per couple and laundering it through the DNC and state party committees. And I know for a fact that some of that was spent during the primaries to support Hillary's digital advertising. But the quibble point here is, oh gosh, this agreement explicitly said that it didn't kick in until after the primaries and a nominee had been confirmed by the convention. And here's one example of a tweet that shows that starting in August of 2015, the DNC submitted to advance approval from Hillary for America for any online or mass email communications that feature a particular Democratic primary candidate. That is read as an opponent, and there were only three, Martin O'Malley, Bernie Sanders, and briefly, Lincoln Chafee. Remember that? <laughs> he was gone in a minute. There's also a widely publicized series of tweets by MSNBC's Joy Reid, which purports to be balanced, but her conclusion was foregone, and I didn't find her argument compelling. But back to Greenwald here. NBC had to update and correct their piece, saying that the agreement clearly allowed the Clinton campaign to influence DNC decisions made during an active primary, even if intended for preparations later. Now, that's not quite accurate either, but <laughs> it was a step in the right direction. I have linked to Greenwald's piece, and I encourage you to read it, because he goes into great detail that I don't have time to relate to you here. Viral falsehood number two was that Sanders signed the same agreement with the DNC that Clinton did. And an A-B comparison proves that this is false. His agreement didn't include any of the provisions vesting control over the DNC that made the Clinton agreement cited by Brazil so controversial. Viral falsehood number three. It appeared, based on a Washington Post headline, that Donna Brazil thought that she individually could just decide to replace Clinton and Kane with Biden and Booker. And it's not true. If you read the whole article, it says later on, buried deep down, that she was referencing a complicated process in the DNC charter that allowed for removal of a nominee who had become incapacitated. I also saw, saw uh, unfair attacks on Donna Brazil suggesting that she's about to go to work for Fox News. 
I have nothing to support that claim. And viral falsehood number four is, quote, evidence has emerged proving that the content of WikiLeaks documents was doctored. And the only claim that's been made is that Guccifer took releases from WikiLeaks and doctored them by adding a watermark that said confidential. He didn't change any of the other verbiage in the text, and that is the only example that's been put forward in an AP story that is then embraced as true across the board by deluded Hillary supporters, many of whom purport to be journalists. And the latest analysis from Bob Perry at ConsortiumNews.com is a very worthy read. He notes that the New York Times, in an editorial today, used the term McCarthyism because there is a Long Island Republican who's running for office in New York City in the uh, upcoming election who has linked his Democratic rival to New York City special interest groups. That's called McCarthyism and followed up by the phrase guilt by association. But <laughs> then Perry goes to work detailing how the New York Times, in the latest case of the uh, uh, releases from the, uh, the, the new, uh, pardon me, but it's, it's a new document dump that's called the Paradise Papers, and it exposes the financial uh, uh, dealings of many prominent people in Russia, the United States, and other countries. Now, I'm going to detail that uh, in a follow-up tomorrow, showing that, for example, Apple is the worldwide tax, tax, tax dodger <laughs> and that that is enabled by uh, various offshore accounts and uh, the kind of uh, uh, scrambling that people do to hide their assets from either disclosure or taxation. And Perry notes the anti-Russian madness has reached such extremes that even when you say something that's obviously true but has also been reported by RT, the Russian television network, you are attacked for spreading Russian propaganda. And he quotes the letter from 100 Clinton supporters that I cited just a moment ago and the gratuitous claim uh, using the word Russia twice, as if Donna Brazil is a tool of Vladimir Putin. Now, she's a tool of the Democratic establishment and corporate interests. Wasn't always that way. She once worked for Jesse Jackson, when he ran for president twice. But if you read Bob Perry's piece, he also shows how Twitter is just bending over after the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing last week. And let me cite this. A lawyer for Twitter announced that if an account was created in Russia, if the user registered the account with a Russian phone carrier or Russian email address, if the user's display name contains Cyrillic characters, if the user frequently tweets in Russian, and if he is logged in from any Russian IP address even a single time, we consider an account to be Russian-linked if it has even one of the relevant criteria. And Perry notes how idiotic this is. None of these criteria would connect to an account of the Russian government, let alone Russian intelligence, or some Kremlin-controlled troll farm. Cyrillic is used in Belarus, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Serbo-Croatia, and Ukraine. So Bob Perry is the adult in the room, thinking clearly, noting the infinitesimal impact that even 125 million Facebook posts would have. And he also notes the hypocrisy that the mainstream U.S. media has now shifted to trying to blame social media for Russian influence of the election because they couldn't come up with evidence to support the broader claims that they've been making for a year now. And he notes the history of people influencing our election, like Israel and other international players. So I encourage you to read his piece. There's one more that I've linked to from James Bovard. He's a man I've encountered a few times over the years. He's a libertarian, a very thoughtful guy. He has a column in USA Today. And he really takes on the demagoguery of what he calls the Facebook farce. 
Russian political ads amounted to only 0.004% of the total content Facebook users saw last year in the United States. Many of the ads were laughable. And yet, Congressman Andre Carson from Indiana says, A dictator like Vladimir Putin abused flaws in our social media platforms to inject the worst kind of identity politics into the voting decisions of at least 100 million people. And Bovard retorts, this presumes Russian ads had a mysterious power to zap the minds of Facebook users who perhaps had zero resistance after viewing too many cat videos. But my experience running a few ads on Facebook for one of my books found that it was a worse investment than buying used lottery tickets from a wino on the street corner. <laughs> no one has proven that Russian ads on Facebook or Twitter had any significant impact, including in the key states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Max Blumenthal is quoted. The liberal Democrats in tech hearings are most outspoken opponents of press freedom and supporters of media censorship. And again, I put it in context. David Brock had trolls working at his super PAC correct the record. And I encountered many of them in, in Facebook posts during the campaign. First, they would uh, respond to anybody who criticized Hillary or supported Bernie. And then they went into to high gear during the campaign. Trump's campaign spent 80 or $85 million on Facebook ads and used micro-targeting to send dark messages to dark-minded people. But Russia is the kryptonite. And that's all we hear about. Russia, Russia, Russia. Hey, and Willie Brown, who is the consummate transactional politician who has never been indicted, he wrote, former Democratic Party chair Brazil told the truth about how Hillary Clinton's operation took over the Democratic committee and used it to help her beat Sanders. And guess what? There was nothing wrong with that. Nothing corrupt or dishonest, says Willie Brown. <laughs> he went on to write, she not only took over the operation, she turned it into an extension of her campaign fundraising machine through which millions of dollars could be collected over and above the usual limits. That was smart and legal says Willie Brown, and uh, Mr. Brown, I disagree with you there. Yes, Bernie Sanders was a loser in the play, so now his followers are screaming. But Bernie is only nominally a Democrat. Have we heard that before? He's always held himself apart from the party operation, and the party owed him nothing. But what about the delegates who were elected by millions of voters across the country? That doesn't matter. And in cold, cold, uh, hard facts, we know the DNC lawyers in court said that the DNC can do whatever it wants. It doesn't have a contract with the voters, and it can use backroom deals or anything else to choose its candidates. That is the brazen attitude inside the party. And here's one more perspective from Ruben Navarrete Jr. He's an op-ed columnist, a Republican, not a Trumper. And he notes that Hillary was recently quoted saying, that the Republican Party has become a far-right, captive party to ideological, religious, and commercial interests. And then he turns those comments on Clinton and his perspective on the Democratic Party. That's what made Clinton's comments about how the Republicans are imploding so surreal. Apparently, she is much better at self-deflection than at self-reflection. And his view of the Democratic Party? The elites have left behind the working class. The white ethnics who helped put the Democratic Party on the map in the 20th century can't see any common cause with Latino and Asian immigrants who helped define the 21st century party. Democrats haven't even started the homework assignment of taking on Trump instead of coming up with an economic message to win back the disaffected white Democrats in Rust Belt state, uh, states. Democratic leaders have bet the farm on Bob Mueller and Russia, Russia, Russia. Clinton has not only made the mess worse, not only did her campaign conspire with the DNC to short-circuit Sanders, she had the gall to write a book in which she blamed Sanders for creating the impression that she was dishonest and untrustworthy. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, that's all on that topic. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work at the Peter B. Collins podcast, and a bunch of you have already captured the new P.O. Box address. Nice going. Paul L. Sesser, my biggest benefactor, always there on the first of the month. Thank you very much. Michael Minton, Fair Oaks, California, kicked in some bucks, as did Kate Brennan in Akron, Ohio. 
I'm grateful to my subscribers and donors, and I invite you to kick in as well. You got five bucks, ten bucks? Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. Click on Menu, pull it down, click on Become a Subscriber. You land on the sign-up page. You can mail a check to my new P.O. Box, which is easy to remember, Box 15660, San Rafael, California, 94915. That's Box 150660, San Rafael, California, 94915. Or you can use the PayPal buttons on the sign-up page to choose a subscription that fits your budget. Well, we had another mass shooting. And when I first heard the news, I cringed. Said, oh, here comes another Islamic suspect who's going to be tweeted to death by Trump. But the shooting outside San Antonio, Texas, at a Christian church was apparently committed by a white Air Force veteran named Devin P. Kelly, age 26. He's dead now. But as a gruesome event, he apparently was angry at his mother-in-law. He has a history of domestic violence, uh, was convicted in a military court, and he recently had made threatening texts regarding his relationship with his mother-in-law. And just look at how different Trump has reacted. Now he's in Japan on his 12-day Asian tour, but he didn't tweet about the death penalty, didn't tweet about Guantanamo, about heavy vetting of immigrants from unrelated countries, No, he said that this isn't a gun thing, this is a mental illness thing. Please move on. Over at Guantanamo, the kangaroos are still misbehaving in the kangaroo court we call military tribunals. And the judge who is presiding over the Nashiri case, he's accused of the coal bombing. His name is uh, Air Force Colonel Vance Spath. And he's the one who locked up the Marines number two lawyer, a brigadier general last week for 48 hours, saying that he was guilty of contempt of court because he wouldn't order defense attorneys to return to work after they resigned in protest of violations of uh, attorney-client confidentiality. Now, the general who was locked up, John Baker, was freed after 48 hours by his Pentagon boss. But the squabble continues... And one of the lawyers who quit, Rick Kamen, who lives in Indianapolis, went to court and got a very unusual uh, order. It's like a preemptive habeas corpus. And the judge in the case properly said that U.S. Marshals may not seize this man, Kamen, and take him before uh, a video conference to hold a hearing at Guantanamo. A preemptive habeas corpus petition. I've never seen anything like it. She also froze any purported requirement for Cameron to appear at the war court headquarters in Virginia and continue to participate in the trial. Nevertheless, the judge at Guantanamo ordered the trial to continue with an attorney who is a recent law school graduate who says, I'm not qualified to handle a death penalty case, and he continues to decline He's in the courtroom, but he declines to make motions or take actions that he says he's not competent to perform. This is a really disturbing, unanimous decision from the Supreme Court. There were no real notations except some justices who added comments. But their comments were in uh, support of the unanimous decision to green light the execution of a man on death row in Alabama who has had several strokes and is mentally incompetent. He is also, according to Justice Stephen Breyer, who supports his execution, despite noting he is legally blind, his speech is slurred, he cannot walk independently, he's incontinent, his disability disability leaves him without a memory of his commission of a capital offense. And on the way up uh, via the appeals court, Judge Beverly Martin wrote for the majority in Atlanta, due to his dementia and related memory impairments, he lacks a rational understanding of the link between his crime and his execution. A person does not rationally understand his punishment if he is simply blindly accepting what he has been told. But the Supreme Court instead dodged that 
by invoking a technicality that comes from a ruling in 1996 by the fucking Supreme Court. Because in 96, they narrowed post-conviction challenges or appeals, and they can occur only when the state court had acted unreasonably in assessing the evidence or had run afoul of clearly established federal law as determined by the Supreme Court. Now, it's modestly encouraging that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, Stephen Breyer, and Sonia Sotomayor agreed that the question of whether a state may administer the death penalty to a person whose disability leaves him without memory of his commission of a capital offense is a substantial question not yet addressed by the court. Well, why don't you address it before you kill this man, not after? A postscript from Justice Breyer. Rather than develop a constitutional jurisprudence that focuses upon the special circumstances of the aged, I believe it would be wiser to reconsider the root cause of the problem, the constitutionality of the death penalty itself. All right, Breyer, nice comment. Why did you sustain the majority decision to execute this man? <sighs> oh, boy. Some big changes in Saudi Arabia as Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is consolidating power. He locked up 11 of the princes of the House of Saud, and their jail is the Ritz-Carlton in the capital of Riyadh. He also removed a prince who was running the major security service, the equivalent, I guess, of the FBI in Saudi Arabia, and he is clearly taking control. This is in the name of a more moderate version of Islam, so it's totalitarian ex uh, expression of power as he claims he's moving to a more moderate position. But, of course, this is the guy who is directing the nasty war in Yemen and has supported many of the Saudi proxies operating in Syria. So uh, the shuffle is critical. And one of the people caught up in this is a well-known billionaire and investor, whose name I always have trouble with. Uh, his name is uh, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal. And he has past and present investments in Twitter, News Corporation, Apple, the Four Seasons. But he is one of the 11 princes who have been locked up. There also was an episode where another royal, Prince Mansur bin Mukrin, was killed a Saturday night in a helicopter crash. Oh, it was actually on Sunday uh, and we don't know if that is nefarious in any way. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia today charged that Iran has committed a blatant act of military aggression by providing its Yemeni allies with a missile fired at the Saudi capital over the weekend. They're saying this could be considered an act of war. And the Iranians consider this a false flag. They say, look, we didn't make that missile. They were produced by the Yemenis and their military industry. Now, I'm not sure about that. I can't prove if they're telling the truth. But the Saudis and the U.S. have long exaggerated any role of Iran in supplying weapons to the Houthi rebels in Yemen. And again, I can't prove or disprove these claims. But the Iranians are clearly very upset by this. And the other shift is that the prime minister of Lebanon went to Riyadh to announce that he is resigning his position in Beirut. He said he did it in protest of Iranian interference in Lebanon through Hezbollah. But it's widely believed that the Saudis leaned on him to step down. And Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, said that uh, Hariri should return to Beirut for power-sharing talks if he is allowed to come back. It was definitely a Saudi decision that was imposed on him. It was not his will to step down. And finally, today, Donald Trump is embarrassing us in one nation after another on his 12-day tour of Asia. He started off in Japan, and he is encouraging Japan to break with the post-war protocol of essentially only having defensive military forces. And Trump is stoking an arms race in Asia 
behind his ginned-up confrontation with North Korea. And this will not end well. He is uh, trying to sell American-made missile defense to Japan. And if the Japanese are smart, they'll get a warranty on this crap because it doesn't work. That doesn't stop Trump. Japan will shoot missiles out of the sky when Abe completes the purchase of lots of equipment from the United States. We make the best by far. It's a lot of jobs for us and a lot of safety for Japan. I'll just let you savor those idiotic comments. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. We give it away free, so share it. Why don't you share it with some Clinton loyalists? I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails